morning. It was good to see so many of you last week at our beach gathering. Uh, make sure that you mark your calendars for October 18th uh, when we'll get together again at the beach to celebrate how good and how gracious God is. Um, also, we're looking at some new ways to try to figure out how we can gather uh, more regularly, so be on the lookout for that. Um, but today, uh, we're continuing to look at how the people of God worship throughout the Bible. And I want to look at a story in the book of Acts, chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them there. And what we find in the book of Acts is the book of Acts tells a story of how the church gets started and how the church spreads the good news of Jesus rising from the dead and, and Jesus ascending to heaven and Jesus sending his spirit to make people new and to remove the guilt and shame of sin and to call us his beloved children. And what we find in, in the story of Acts is that despite this incredibly good news of Jesus, many people refused to believe his truth and opposed anything and anyone who claimed Jesus as the only answer to the world's problems, and really as the only way to God. Not much has changed, has it? You see, we, we live in a culture that promotes self-heroism. Whatever each person decides is right, and whatever brings them peace with God is good for them. If I if I do good, or if I, if I worship Buddha, or if I worship Muhammad, or if I follow a cult like Mormonism, or I choose no religion at all, which really is just self-worship, it's all good. Whatever you believe is good for you. We're all in charge of our own destiny by how we live, really thus making each individual their own hero and really their own God. And then, as, as Christians, when we come along and say, no, 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 that's not the truth. There's, there's not a hundred ways to God. Jesus is the only truth. He is the only way. It's offensive, and it, it's not sensitive. It's, it's, it's unkind and rude in the hearts of hearers because it attacks their self-heroism. Humans don't like being told they're not the hero. That they're, that they're wrong, that they need to humble themselves under a holy God. People don't want to hear that Jesus is the hero and not them. And so they fight for themselves, and they do all kinds of things to keep the true message of Jesus subdued in their life and in the culture abroad. It was, it was no different in the book of Acts. Nothing has changed. Our culture that we live in right now is not special. The lie has been and always will be the same until Jesus returns and takes what is rightfully his from a defeated world and a defeated Satan. But here is the good news. Jesus is more powerful than mine or yours or anyone else's self-heroism. And he is the one that comes in and rescues people and opens their eyes to see him. Which which is exactly what we see him do here in the book of Acts with, with a man named Saul. Now Saul was a, was a very highly educated man who traveled in all the right religious circles and, and who, when first confronted with the truth of Jesus, fought to save his own hero status. And he fought to destroy anyone who believed in Jesus and told him that Jesus was the only way to God. And this fight of his led him to go door to door and to just drag people out of their homes and out of their places of business and to beat them and to kill them and to throw them in a jail for saying, Jesus is God. His, his fight, this fight of Saul, was, was applauded by the culture and he gained much notoriety for fighting for the truth of the culture. Yet in the midst of this fight, as he's on the way to another city to commit these same horrific acts against Christians, God meets Saul, and he meets him in the form of a, of a bright light, which blinds his eyes. And then a few days later, God opens his, his eyes and he's to see the truth of Jesus. And Saul believes, and God changes his name to Paul. Paul then does a, does a complete 180 and turns from, from promoting self-heroism and self-worship to proclaiming the true hero of the story is Jesus, and that Jesus is the only one worthy of worship. And out of this, this, uh, this amazing transformation, God uses Paul to then start and to train and to encourage many churches 
throughout the Roman world. And in chapter 16 of Acts, where we find our story today, we find Paul and Silas, who, who is a, Paul, Silas is another church planner, and they're traveling from, from city to city, and they're proclaiming Jesus as king. And in a dream, um, Paul receives a vision of a man in Macedonia, begging him to come and to help them. And so Paul and Silas head in that direction, and they start traveling around southern Europe, and they come to a city uh, of Philippi. And we're, we're really not told when or what day they exactly arrive, but, but on the Sabbath or, or Saturday, they, they go down to the river and they, they, they find a place to pray. And as they get to the river, they, they come across a bunch of women. And so they start sharing with them about Jesus. I want, just as you pause in the story for a second, um, this alone is an amazing picture of grace. Paul and Silas sitting down and teaching women was way outside of the cultural norms of the day. But it's also exactly what we see Jesus do as well in the story. Jesus doesn't follow the broken norms of culture. Rather, we see Jesus um, um, sees all people as, as having equal value, and he sits down alongside them, and he shares his life with them. Which, by the way, should give us a clue on how we're to interact in our city. That regardless of race or economic status or gender or sexual sexual orientation, as the people of God, we sit down alongside of them and we graciously point them to the real hero of the story, which is Jesus. And so this is what Paul and Silas are doing, and they're they're sharing the good news of Jesus. And and as they share, um, a businesswoman named Lydia, uh, she, she hears the message and she comes to faith. And she confesses her need of Jesus, and and she brings Paul and Silas to her home uh, to tell all of her family. And her whole family sees their need of Jesus, and and they get saved. And and really, the the church in Philippi starts. And as a a little time goes by, um, Paul and Silas are are back down at the river, and they're praying, and and they're they're interacting with another woman. Now, this woman uh, was a little bit different. She She was a slave who was possessed by a demon. And, and as, the, as this demon possessed her, she made lots of money for her owners by telling people their futures. And for the next few days, she starts following Paul and Silas around. Um, and, and, and she's following them around. And as she's following them, she's shouting. And, and she's shouting this. We see in verse 17, she says this. These men are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Verse 18, she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. I, I love the, the detail and really the, the humanness of this part of the story, that, that Paul grows, grows weary of the shouting that he, that he can't take it anymore. The, really, the, the Greek word here is actually um, exasperated. Um, he's, he's done with it. But, but notice who he's actually annoyed with. He's not annoyed with the woman. He's actually annoyed with the demon. That even though this demon was speaking the truth, there was a, there was a greater need for him to care for this woman and to free her from the misery of being controlled and her value being placed on only what she could perform. And so Paul, Paul cast out this demon, and, and this makes the owners of her very angry. And so they drag Paul and Silas into the town square before the local rulers, and they bring, they bring false charges up against them. And they're, they're, they say that they're throwing the city into an uproar. And so others who aren't even involved jump in and start attacking them. And I can kind of imagine this, this crazy scene of, a, of an angry mob screaming and spitting on Paul on Silas. And, and it doesn't matter what they would say, it would be used against them. And so they just stand there silent in the chaos as it swirls around them. And so the local rulers see this, this uproar and agree that the charges must be true. And so they send them to be punished. And so Paul and and Silas are are stripped down naked. Their hands are tied to a pole and they're brutally beaten. And verse verse 23 says that they were severely flogged 
or, or caned it's a, as a, with sticks, beaten with sticks as a form of, of corporal punishment. After they're beaten, they're, they're dragged off and thrown in jail, and their, their feet are, are locked in stocks. And the jailer puts them in the inner cell. Now, if you do, if you do a little research, you'll find out the, that many of the Roman prisons that day were underground. They were really underground dungeons with, with a little metal grate on top. And they, they usually were these, these large holes that, that progressively wound themselves deeper and deeper into the ground and, and different layered caverns uh, like cells that got smaller and smaller and smaller until you found yourself at the bottom of a hole. And so here we find Paul and Silas with their bodies all bruised and bloody and their feet locked in a piece of wood, looking up at a, at a dim light um, as they lay on the bottom of a dark hole on a cold, damp, filthy, foul-smelling floor. You can, I can only imagine and think you can imagine what this floor was like as, as every prisoner above them their fluids have dripped down the walls and made it to the bottom of the innermost cell where they laid. So let's take a look at verse 26 and we'll see what they do as they find themselves in this situation. Actually, verse 25. Verse 25 says this. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly... There was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And the jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, and he drew his sword and he was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Just for a little context here, in, in that time, the jailer was responsible for the prisoners. And, and if the prisoners escaped, he and his family then received the punishment of the escaped prisoners. It was an exchange of, of transfer of guilt. It was his freedom was transferred to the ex-prisoners and their guilt and punishment was placed on him and his family. So rather than, than face the pain and suffering and punishment, he draws his sword to take his own life, only to be stopped by the one who he had just beaten and abused. Does any of that sound vaguely familiar? Let's go on in verse 29. Verse 29, as the story continues, says this. It says, The jailer called for the lights. He rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his home. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. And the jailer brought them into his home and set a meal before them. And he was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. What an amazing story. What an amazing turn of events. And there's, there's so much in there that we could dig out. But I want to just point out a few things and then we'll, we'll send you guys to discuss it some more. But first of all, I, I, want, to, I want to see this, that, that attacks often come right after victories. So we should expect them in your life and my life. You see, we see this all throughout the Bible, and I know that it's true in my life. Satan often attacks after victories to discourage and to take your focus off of God and what he has just done. If you read the story of the Bible, you will see this over and over again. It's even a, it's even a theme in Jesus' story. And here again, we see it in, in Paul and Silas' life. They, they had just had a dream from God telling them where to go and they obey and they get to see a woman and her entire family come to faith. They, they get to interact with another woman. They've just cast out a demon and the church is growing in a new place. And wham, in a matter of hours, they're at the bottom of a pit, beaten up, bruised, laying in feces. 
And the reality is that until Jesus returns and the effects of sins are removed and Satan is bound for good, brokenness and attack will often follow victories in your life. And you and I should expect it to happen. The question becomes, where is our focus and where is our worship going to be when this happens? You see, I sense that often the reality is that when life is tough and when we're in pain and when the, our human tendency is to fixate on our circumstances, often it's, it's all we see. Here are my crappy circumstances. This is all my stuff. This is where I'm at. This is what is going bad. We say, why, 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 why me? And see, when we live that way and we think those things, what we've done is we believe that the story is about us. And our worship then is on created things rather than on the creator. But the truth is that the story is not about us. It's about God. So the question becomes, I think, how do we worship in the midst of pain? How do we shift our eyes upward towards God, even when our world is falling apart and we're at the bottom of a pit. If you take a look at what Paul and Silas do uh, in verse 25, it says they're doing two things. They're, they're praying and they're singing hymns to God. And they, they weren't doing this silently, but out loud and in the presence of others. So first they're praying, and the prayer here is, is an acknowledgement of their situation. It's, it's not a prayer, if you get out of me, get me out of this, I'll worship you. Rather, it's a prayer of worship in the midst of suffering that says, God, you are good. I, I don't like what's happening to, to me, and I need you, and I acknowledge that you're good, and that I can trust you despite my circumstances. It's, it's a prayer that, that doesn't sugarcoat the brokenness that they're in, but it's also a prayer that acknowledges God's presence in the midst of it. The second thing they're doing here is they're, they're singing hymns. When, when, we, when we sing hymns, what we're doing, or songs, what we're doing is we're recounting God's faithfulness in the past. We're reminding our hearts of his story, and we're, we're calling out and we're, we're remembering his characteristics. It's, it's an act of worship that, that reminds us and others who, who really is is God and, and why he's worth looking at rather than our circumstances. And they, they're acknowledging their circumstances here, but they're also acknowledging that God is greater. And so they're doing these two things. They're praying and they're singing out loud in the presence of others. And I want to ask the question, why, why are they doing that? Because worship has always intended to be a corporate thing. It always has been since the beginning of time. God created humans to worship together. And in doing so, as they worship together, they would display his glory to the earth. If you read the Bible, you will see this over and over again. And even after the fall, it's the same role that he gave the nation of Israel. And it's the same role that now he's given to the church. That as the people of God, we would worship together and it would be so p powerful that it would be a testimony of his grace to the world. And when we worship, it, what it does is it moves us and others towards grace. You see, Paul and Silas had, had every right to be angry with the, with the jailer and with, with others who had, had mistreated them. But their worship of God turns their own hearts towards grace and towards, turns others towards grace because they acknowledge the depth of grace that they've received themselves. You see, their worship not, doesn't just turn their own hearts. It turns the hearts of others who are watching them worship in the midst of their brokenness. And so when we see God send deliverance in the form of an earthquake, not only did Paul and Silas not run out of the prison as the doors were open and the chains were off, but none of the other prisoners do either. And when the jailer comes running up and he's dreading to draw his sword to kill himself, they cry out and say, no, stop, we're all here. This is a selfless act of grace towards the jailer. This grace extended to him calls, causes him to, to call out and to learn how he and his family might receive the ultimate grace of God. You see, proper worship always turns our hearts to grace, and grace begets grace to others. 
And see, Paul and Silas understood the good news um, is that Jesus didn't stop like the jailer. Instead, Jesus allowed himself to be killed so that those who believed might receive the great exchange and be taken from the prison of slavery and to be set free to live in the castle. Jesus walked his life in in proper worship. Jesus was betrayed by Judas. He was falsely accused. He was mocked. He was stripped naked. He was beaten in public. He was taken to be tortured to death. And as he's hanging on the cross, instead of looking at his circumstances, he looks up and he worships the Father. And he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And because of that, because of that act, the great exchange is now possible. You see, Jesus is right now sitting at the right hand of God, extending grace to all who look to him and to turn their worship off of self-heroism and to acknowledge him as the true hero and the story, the, who, the true hero of the story and the one worthy of worship. You see, that is the good news and that's the truth that allows Paul and Silas and you and I to look up and to worship the gracious king instead of our current circumstances. And as the people of God, we get to extend grace to others out of the abundance that we've received. That's the life of worship that you and I get to live in each day, regardless of what is going on in our lives. Father, we thank you um, for this story that we get to see Paul and Silas um, live a life of worship. Father, I pray that we wouldn't look to them as as good examples of worship, but Father, we would look to you as the only one that's worthy of worship. Father, I pray that your grace would be so relevant and so um, into the depths of our lives that we would extend that to others and we would only worship you because you are the only one worthy of worship. Father, I pray that you would take our prayers and our singing um, and that we would do that corporately as a family, as a church, and that others would get to see the good news of Jesus. Father, we pray that you would reach out to many in our city and save entire households like we see in this story. Father, we thank you for your goodness and for your grace. We thank you that we get to worship you and you alone. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.